let's do it. <laughs> so look, it's it's been exciting seeing your work over the last probably year, eighteen months, because you've had so much stuff coming out. And and with with the pandemic like really screwing up productions throughout twenty twenty and early twenty twenty one, have a lot of those projects been things that have been done and just waiting to come out or have you still been working consistently throughout that whole time um i've been busiest as i've ever been um funny enough um and um but at the same time it's it's interesting because um most of the projects were kind of either they were just kind of going into the pandemic or we were just kind of starting during the pandemic um uh, you think I've done enough projects, just wait till like the next couple of months. You'll, you'll <laughs> notice what I've been up to. But um, but no, it's always, uh, it's all, um, funny enough, a lot of my filmmaker friends, we they're all kind of just those people that just want to go and make a film. Um, they don't care how to do it. And um, it was like one of those things. Uh, I did Becky right as, the, as COVID was kind of just finishing, uh, starting. Uh, was doing another movie, uh, Devil Inside, which was called Sugar Pill, that, that for a while, and um, I did that one, and then we did. There's another one that I did, and there's another just like literally constantly. It was like, but um, yeah, it was it was one of those things that kind of was a therapy for me. It was just be able to kind of just come into the studio and just write, uh, you know. And I've I've been doing that for for a long time, but that's this has been my kind of therapist. You know what I mean? Uh, during yeah. the whole COVID and kind of just all the mental shit that goes through it so I mean that's great that's so fortunate just because obviously not everyone um, had that so that's I mean that's awesome and yeah we were uh it's funny because uh we had a we had a baby uh so it was like well, c- uh, congratulations thanks uh so we, we, we it wasn't like during kind of COVID uh he was uh, he was born in July, so like January, February kind of hit. So that's when it was like, oh, he was crawling around. Uh, so it was we're lucky enough to have like a backyard and stuff. So for us, it was just like, okay, we're all home, so let's just hang out with the child. Uh, and so and it was that I would, I would I would just hang out with the baby and just write music, and it was just like this kind of weird little uh, commune of just <laughs> artists <laughs> just writing a bunch of kids. Just <laughs> no, we only have one kid, but it's like just a kid like crawling around and it was just that's what it was and still we're kind of going the same kind of route which has been awesome that's awesome and and yeah i was curious how you balance that working full-time because obviously film composing is typically not a a non-time consuming job i mean a lot of the times especially when you get into crunch time you know you're working your butt off so how's how's the balance between that and having a young child so, um, I mean, I've been, um, I've had this kind of sort of a, uh, before COVID, I had a studio in Marina del Rey with, uh, with uh, composers uh, in the studio kind of house. We had a mixing room and we had an entire stage. Uh, right six months before kind of COVID, I got rid of, um, I got rid of the studio and uh, we got into this house. Uh, and this house, uh, basically we have, I have a guest house and this is where we are kind of thing. And there's rooms at, at all the other places. But... The balance is just kind of I've kind of created I've always had this schedule of trying to be a nine to six kind of a guy. I know there's a couple of other composers that do that. Um, whether I keep it or not, it's just pretty pretty eight hours a day. I, I walk into the studio at a certain time and I don't leave for a certain time. Um, but the fun part about it is that um, if I get a little knock on the door, I, I'll be able to open the door and he could just walk in and he's. He's two now, so he's like kind of comes and sits on the couch and just like watches whatever Blippy or whatever on his uh, <laughs> on his uh, on the iPad or just like kind of just watches something as I'm working. Uh, and uh, that's that's was always my dream. That's why I got rid of the studio, uh, kind of. And it's it's kind of funny because like he's two year old and he has synthesizers and he plays with my piano and like knocks on stuff and it's like it's it's weird. Um, but at the same time, this is just like, this is, this is the life of a composer slash father, uh, thing, but, uh, I'm, I'm lucky my wife works from home as well. So it's this balance of, uh, she's just taking care of him and kind of working and same, same exact thing. I get to walk out that door and I'm, I'm with him and I walk in and I get to lock the doors. <laughs> <laughs> That's the balance. Um, I, I, again, yeah, I've, I've had this schedule kind of, I'm a schedule composer. Um, I've. 
I avoided the voices in my ears of, oh, here's a melody, take it down. I still walk around with my phone and do that, but um, usually I'm a 9 to 6, uh, 10 to 7, 10 to 6, or whatever. I go have dinner, and then I come back in when everybody is back, goes, goes to sleep. So um, that's also the schedule, too, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Uh, but no, I've, I've become very disciplined for some odd reason, um, and I'm not disciplined at all in the rest of my life, but just this <laughs> is very strange to me. I mean, that's an important facet to be disciplined in. Um, so with, with setting those kind of more regimented time frames, do you ever get in the studio or you know, in front of the computer, in front of the instruments, and just sit there and not have anything come to you? Or is whenever sure. whenever you're there, like, it's just flowing? Uh, you know, I'm lucky that it kind of usually is flowing, uh, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of and a big kind of advocate of first thought, best thought, so I don't lurk around in that kind of realm of, is this okay? Uh, there's sometimes I just don't have time for it. So, uh, I mean, I truly believe composers, especially in the media composers, were better improvisers than actual composers because it's literally we're watching picture and we're trying to figure this out. So it's a lot of it is improvising and figuring out like what actually fits and not. Um, and but but well, usually when I come in, it's yeah, it's there. Um, it's you know, it's work as well. So. Um, at least for me, it's like, oh, okay, I got to make sure I get out uh, three minutes a day. If I don't, yeah, I, I have to do six minutes tomorrow. So, uh, but, but if, I have, if I have that slump, usually I just move on to the next scene or move on to the, usually I have two or three projects going. So it's easy for my mind to switch from a comedy to a horror, to a thriller, to something else, to a video game or whatever, um, and go back and forth, you know. Interesting. I mean, and, and that makes a lot of sense. And that's probably one of the benefits of having all those, you know, sure. especially, especially being in different genres. You know, if you had four projects and they were all like slasher horror films, you it might be a little crazy. more in trouble. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I am a, I, I, I hate to say it, but like my, 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 I have an overactive imagination and I just need to feed it all the time. So uh, if I'm not working, I'm doing something else. Uh, if I'm not writing music, I'm building a desk. Or uh, if I'm not doing this, I'm uh, I'm I'm in the garage, like I don't know, figuring out synthesizers. Or I have to do something that that my mind would be busy. Or I write a script. Or start getting into fashion or whatever. Um, it's it's all of those things that kind of I stay creative. Um, and when I'm on multiple projects, it's literally that need of. Um, hey, I'm on a horror film. I've been on it for three months, four months. What else can I do? And I mean, I um, I like to call myself a chameleon of doing all of these different genres. And it's just been, um, that's, I guess, that's what a real composer should be able to do. Uh, you know what I mean? It's like those look at Bernard, like I hate, not, again, I'm not comparing myself to Bernard Herman, Jerry, or whatever. Uh, I'm just saying it's like, at least as a media composer, if you want to put your title as that, you better... If there's a picture in front of you, that'll be scored no matter what the genre is. You know, that's at least I, I, from all the people that I've worked with, they've all been those filmmakers that want to jump genres. So it's been fun to do a comedy and then go to a horror and then a weird animation <laughs> back to back and then go to a Western next. <laughs> so that's, that's, it's fun. It's really, really fun to do that. So is that, is that a kind of need to have your creativity engaged all the time has that been something that's stuck with you you know since you were a little kid and is that kind of what pushed you into music in the first place um i mean that's a that's a very big question my friend no um <laughs> as far as um I mean, um, my, I've always been a very musical kid. Um, I started playing music since I was five years old, uh, whether it was my parents' needs or my parents forcing me to do it. Uh, imagination has always been one of those things. I, my, my brother, me and my brother are like eight years apart, so there was this all this kind of just me by myself figuring out Legos, things I'm at, like things to just kind of for me to create. It's always been one of those things. Um, music has been around my life and it was like one of those things is do i want to become a persian classical musician and just play sand tour the rest of my life with uh with a bunch of older people no offense uh but or do i want to write do i want to get out of the box and do i want to do what i've always wanted to do improvise break an instrument go and figure out what uh where is this 
the unique instrument I could find out of, uh, I don't know, Maharashtra. It, you know what I mean? Like, that's that's what I love doing. And that's kind of came back to this. But then I, I've, I've always loved storytelling. So um, storytelling is a very big part of our Iranian culture. So uh, it kind of lends its hand to that same thing. And uh, I get to tell a story with the helping hand, hands of the other people. And it, it's that's, that's, that's the, the creative part about it that comes back to it. I mean, and that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, talking about Iranian culture, I, and and like you already mentioned this, that you play some Iranian, Persian, Middle Eastern instruments. I guess, and I don't want to get on like too much of a tangent of this, but I you know I Go find it really it. No, interesting. Sure. <laughs> no, um, sure. So, first off, how? How often do you try to implement those into your scoring? And is it just when it feels naturally or because I don't, th- I mean, personally, I don't think that there are a lot of like Iranian, Middle Eastern sure. composers, sure. at least sure. act, you know, uh, in the there U.S. Is, uh, there is two of us. Uh, I know the <laughs> other one. Uh, then there is a half Iranian, half Spanish. He's he's been my Navid Hajazi who plays violin mm. for me all the time. Then there's Ramin Javadi, uh, who uh, who's half Iranian, half German. Um, that's it. But <laughs> uh, but as far as uh, classically trained film composers, uh, I think I'm probably the only one, unless there's somebody else kind of just um, starting out. For me, uh, you know, uh, as a I was I was a young kid starting in this kind of world of older. Uh, Iranian uh, masters so I was always this kind of rebel kid going into these classes and just not understanding the repertoire or not memorizing it and just kind of improvising and going on tap tangents and most of my masters were like no that's not right um, but for me the film music and kind of this media comp- composition it's always been uh, colors uh, whatever those colors are what are the unexpected colors so like you see there's a hammer of dulcimer over here on this side wherever that is right here mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> there is there's a whole wall of instruments here all of these are colors for me it doesn't matter the region or not I I studied music anthropology so I understand all of these cultures all of these kind of perspectives uh, of doing something that we're using taikos and creating new drums and creating new languages for a specific region um, I think it's appropriate for, for, for us to kind of just look at all of these instruments, especially for a composer, to be able to look at it and be like, what are the limits of this instrument, whether whether it is from a specific culture, unless you're literally working on that culture. Um, but I, I'll say this as well, um, as, as you probably already know, I, I'm a big advocate of authenticity, absolute authenticity for whatever you're doing. So, But in the same time, like... If you understand authenticity and you're actually do, do, dealing with a specific region, go for it. Absolutely, go be as authentic as possible. But uh, for me, and, and that's the same thing, it's like if I'm dealing with a specific region, I'm going to be as authentic as possible. And, but these are all just colors for me. Like I'll, I'll put an amp on this dulcimer and just it'll sound like a really cool guitar. Um, my hands just move faster on a dulcimer, you know? Uh, so. Or like I would take a frame drum from uh, from Iran, whatever it's a big one or a small one, we'll detune it, and it sounds like a weird taiko, um, you know. So <clears throat> for me, it's the goal of the colors, the goal of the sound, whether it's from this region or not, it really doesn't matter. Um, if there's a cool drone I could get from a Esraj, why not? You know, um, it sounds cool, it works against picture. That's all that matters. So that's actually really interesting. That's, in one sense, a little outside of what I expected. Because here I was thinking, oh, you know, you can't, like, you can't use a, a hammer dulcimer in something like Detroit Become Human because why not? <laughs> but but that's exactly it. And then especially too, you're talking about well, you're not. It's not just sitting in front of a mic and recording the dulcimer. Like, there are a ton of things you can do to just totally change the sound. So that's that's sure. actually really interesting. Yeah, I mean, why not? Um, The thing is that a lot of these instruments were created for composers to go and compose music. Um, Whether I am a composer or not, quote unquote, I make music, uh, whatever that music is. Um, But the violin was created for players and the composers. So the composers were trying to figure out what the limits of this instrument is, whether it's small or not. 
then let's make it bigger. Oh, we got a viola. Oh, let's make it huge. Like, we got a cello. So um, if that if the cello was created in, um, I don't know, in a specific region, it will be called at the cello from that region. You know, that, that instrument is from that region specifically. Yes, sure. But what is it? Can it what can it do uh, in the world of media composition? You know, it all comes back to the storytelling. Um, if I'm trying to tell a story and this specific, I don't know, maybe a Tutari from that we were talking about India, if this, if this beautiful horn that is only played in weddings, can it be played for funerals? You know, why not? You know, that's, that's the, that's the fun part. If, if the story has just kind of, we're, we're doing something really cool. Why not? Let's try that. Or, um, can we take a banjo and uh, make it sound like something else, uh, that it's something unexpected, that the project will kind of have a signature to walk on, you know? Um, that's that's what I try to reach for. I don't know. I, I think that's Maybe so some cool. acid and maybe some <laughs> mushrooms. I don't know, man. But but that's how it is. <laughs> well, no, I, I love it. and And I think from the listener's side, a lot of the time you're you're listening to something and like take your your score to the night where you you hear these kind of walls of sound and strings and and you listen and you're like i i could not tell you what's making those but that's not really the point like whatever yeah. whatever it is whatever you're doing it works and like it's scary you know um i always say if a single note piano works on a scene it works that's it. Um, we just did, uh, I mean, I'm on a movie right now, and then we just did this thing for uh, with five bass clarinets and four bass flutes. Um, I mean, again, I'm kind of, I, I'm, I'm this non-classically trained musician that I love everything. So, like, I started understanding aleatoric music and chance music and uh, generative music just for this. And, and I was like, okay, how do we kind of get in front of these woodwind players? And how do I create this air? And how do I just make these players play without me giving them notes? Uh, and we did that same thing with the night because we're dealing with breaths and we're dealing with kind of things like that. So I was just like, here's a bunch of graphics. Go nuts. You know, um, I'm fortunate to be able to do that, uh, but you can still do it on a computer. I used to do that, you know? Uh, that You start kind of somewhere and then you go somewhere. But um, the night is kind of the same exact idea. It's like, we're trying to create an atmosphere. What does this atmosphere sound like? Um, if I go into details of like, yeah, I used microtunes and I did this and I used Iranian instruments and I did that. Can I do that probably with other instruments? For sure, 100% I can. Um, but it was just, that's what it was in my hands and that's what it was like kind of just like, I was like, all right, this is it. Um, and most of the times, it's again, it's like first thought, best thought. Uh, if I have a cello in my hand and it just starts playing and it's like, whoa, that's creepy, then it works, you know, it's creepy. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know what I mean? Sorry. Hey, no problem. I, you know, if it's uh, important or something, you got to get it. I'm trying to get a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> and it's my art. It's, uh, we're trying to figure out if I'm going to do a line drawing or if I'm going to do a shape. So that's not important. <laughs> yeah, that's it. What's uh, what's it going to be of? Uh, I'm trying to. F uh, it's going to be of that. No, it's going to be of the of the dulcimer kind of hammer. Uh, so uh, my tattoo artist was like, "Yeah, it's going to take two and a half hours," and I'm like, "It's not going to take two and a half hours." Uh, but like, I wanted like real life, like this size kind of thing right oh, here. Wow. So. Um, I don't know. I have two other tattoos that have just become an obsession, so it's like, <laughs> why not? So. See, and it's, look, it's music related, so it fits on here. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Segway back to it, yeah. Um, so, and look, staying in the authenticity realm of things, it's another thing that I find interesting. You know, I know that you are launching an initiative i think it's it's supposed it was to, supposed be, ready to be, next launched, year. be yeah I, I was supposed to be launching it to be honest i've just been so busy that i haven't been able to figure out the requirements yet it's all being done by myself so it's this it's this task that i've taken on i mean uh the only reason i took it on was ucla i mean we can come back to it uh but uh the initiative was just because of kind of i just saw a lack of it and that's, that's hmm. what it was yeah i mean and and 
So no, broadly, you know, the the initiative is amplifying the voices and presence of Middle Eastern composers. I mean, like we just talked about, you you can name off the top of your head the three Iranian or half Iranian com- like film composers working. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I mean, the yeah the, the reason I kind of wanted to do it it's it's middle eastern kind of initiative doesn't matter if it's from iran doesn't matter if it's from just a region itself you know um the the world of middle eastern and iranian music once i literally say that the the things that come into your mind is a duduk is a dombak uh, unless you're trained a little bit better or, or you're trained a little bit more in the world of middle eastern music then you go into kind of like oh there is a sitar uh, and there's a sitar but they have they're two completely different instruments. Um, it's not more of kind of just me teaching these things. It's more for people to understand it. You know, somebody has to do it for all, everyone to kind of just understand what this culture is, whether it's the musical culture and it, uh, that's what it is. Uh, but when you look at the Middle East um, on picture and you type in whatever, we're in Middle East, uh, I just hope then what I'm trying to do is just, I just hope the composer doesn't go and grab a duduk and be like, we're in the Middle East. Welcome. That's that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and whether this kind of takes on the other world of just be as authentic as you can um, in whether the projects that you're working on, um, if you're working on kind of a South African project, make sure it's so authentic to that region as possible without kind of without your limitation of whatever it's on picture, obviously. But like if you're going to do a, if you're going to do music from a specific region, go and understand it before you just pull in an instrument and just do it. You know what I mean? That's that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and it's also kind of just letting people understand that uh, it's not just about brown people or a person that has a beard um it's we we know how to write music uh whether it's with dombacks or not <laughs> i could get in front of a choir and i could make it sound like anybody else you know that's uh, it's it's these cliches that unfortunately has been thrown at um not just middle easterns other kind of minorities or whatever majorities even as well so i that's the, i'm trying to kind of just create this authenticity um advocacy more than anything else you know is that, and, you know, I don't want you to start naming names and publicly sure. shaming people, but, like, is that an issue that you've seen really rampantly in film music? I mean, because, look, honestly, historically and even even now, like, the vast majority of your film composers are going to be, like, white guys from the U.S. or the U.K. And I, it's probably pretty easy to take a film that's set in Iran or India or China and, like, hit a couple instruments that everyone's going to be sure. familiar with and sure. go, oh, yeah, like, this is the instrument, like, it's it's set in that place. Love it. You know, if, uh, if that's the scenario and that's what you have access to, um, what I'm not going to name names. I'm not going to go into details, but uh, not details. There's, not, there's no details. You could, you could watch it. <laughs> but uh, more it's this... Um, if you have the assets and if you have the budget and if you have these access and you can actually go and understand this um if you're writing a music in middle east figure out where you are if you're in turkey you're in turkey if you're in saudi arabia you're in saudi arabia if you're in tehran you're in tehran if you're in afghanistan you're in afghanistan um just like if you're in china you're in china you're not in japan completely dudes you know um why do you and I kind of as, as we're kind of chatting about this and um, whether I understand it or not, whether you understand it or not, you could easily say, hey, Chinese music is completely different than Japanese music. Uh, they have similarities, but they are different. Um, why can we say, hey, Saudi Arabia music is completely different than Afghanistan music? It's not the same thing. Um, that's that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> oh, you know I, mean, I mean, I, I think so, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it just like just like when I get on a project and uh, we are in uh, New Orleans, I'm gonna do everything in my power and figure out if I could find a detuned banjo that is specifically from New Orleans, uh, that is from Bayou, that's from the region, that I'm exactly that. I will go out and find a spoon that is exactly the way that the spoon players are playing it. That's what I'm gonna try to do. Uh, that's 
why not? Again, picture serves exactly what we need to do. Um, if the picture requires you to go and um, stay in a tent uh, for, I don't know, six months to understand a specific uh, region of this group of people that live in middle of nowhere, that's, as a, that's, that's the job of a media composer, you know? Uh, we're trying to tell the exact specific story of that character. So, why not? Yeah. And I, I do appreciate the caveat you put in the beginning of both what the picture requires and then also the limits of what's around you. I mean, if you, have, sure. if you have a couple weeks and a small budget... 100%. Listen, if you, you have everything. if you have five grand on your music budget and it's literally just East-West Raw or Spitfire sample libraries, that's all it is. But but if you can buy it in, by go on Fiverr for God's sake, <laughs> go on Fiverr <laughs> and type in literally the region, you'll find a bunch of musicians that um, that is that are just amazing players. Um, I discovered Fiverr because of that because I was looking for things. Um, there are there are two rabbit holes in this world. One is YouTube and one is Fiverr. Uh, both of them will take you amazing places if you actually let them do it. And they could take you dark places too. But um, these rabbit holes are awesome to go down on. Uh, hiring a musician for 20 bucks and having them just jam through your track, it's not going to... Uh, it's kind of two sandwiches for that musician. You know what I mean? Um, why not? Yeah, oh, and uh, I'll say there's there's a third rabbit hole, which is Wikipedia as well. You know, I, I haven't gotten to <laughs> that yet. You know, uh, the, uh, I it's it's weird for me that people get to just kind of do and just change as much as they want. It, that's funny to me. Um, I I'm I, I'll let you know once I go down that rabbit <laughs> hole on my next procrastination period. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> the YouTube can get you really dark, man. But like. Those twenty-five minute Vice videos are not going to watch themselves. You know, uh, uh, it's either that or Blippy on my iPad or just whatever TV. So I'll take Vice over that. Look, the the other thing that I I find interesting, and you, know, you hit it right on the head, talking about if you if you have something that's set in New Orleans, it's going to like you're going New Orleans specific because, like, look, we're in the U.S. We're not viewing the U.S. as just a monolithic country. And and I think that's also the issue you get a lot of that a lot of composers run into is they view Africa as like sure. oh it's it's Africa China I mean China's the size of the U S but there's sure. you know five times as many people like yep. there there are so many really really distinct nuances even within a, a continent or a country or region that you know like you're saying if you have the resources man you you really better be narrowing you it know, down. You know, again, um, it all comes back to our job. You know, my job is to find new colors, to find new ways. If I'm not bettering myself as a musician or as a producer, composer, whatever, sound maker, if I'm not bettering myself in understanding what, what is out there, um, why am I doing this? Uh, you know, um, whether I'm going to go and find this amazing musician out of Iceland that's just making, I don't know, a synthesizer. You know, why are we not giving that guy some credit that he's putting himself out there and doing that? Or what if what if this amazing girl is out of this village of, I don't know, uh, middle of nowhere Turkey, um, and she's playing this amazing music uh, from these amazing instruments that no one knows about? Uh, Let's look at it. Maybe I could learn something from it. Maybe I could learn a new scale that I could put in my horror movie. You know, it's all of that. Uh, it's these these things are just kind of for for us to be able to make it into a play doh uh, of of that. You know, I I'm, a, I'm I'm you know I I did a movie. It was a horror movie in called The Pyramid. You know, um, it was for a bigger studio film and. Even for a horror film, I went and was like, all right, how do I figure this out? How do I come up with, can I find a, can I find a person from Egypt that would come and actually play for me? What are the sounds from that? You know, um, I, I did pull a Zerna. I did pull a Duduk. I did pull all of those instruments in there because I was trying to make it a little bit more things. But then just, I brought it back. I kick the piano you know but it's all that matters you know it's, it's that's what it is but then at least if you're able to throw some sort of authenticity to at least give a nod hey i did my job 
I did my work and I went and looked at it. I went and found it. Like, like we have many composers that have done that. Ludwig, Hans, um, J and H, HGW, all of those guys are, have done all of that. JW, all, all of these guys have done amazing, amazing work. Uh, and they've done it. Why not? You know, why not us younger generation? Why are we not putting in the work? You know, it, that's, that's, it sucks when I see it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it. It bothers me so much, man. It bothers me so much. I'm like, ah, you missed an opportunity. Yeah, well, and, and it's interesting you mentioned it because I was actually, I was talking on Twitter with a, a young composer today about that sort of thing and about some of Ludwig Göransson's recent work as well. And like, in one sense, even if even if the music doesn't land, like taking those creative choices and taking risks and doing things that are unexpected, I mean, it. You I mean, know, one, it's it's interesting, but it's it it's just something you you have to do, or else we're just going to hear the same stuff. Should, yeah, you know, you know, I'll I'll, I'll give you a very simple. Uh, I'll put it in a different uh, different terms, uh, not music wise. Okay, so so you can kind of get uh, get what where I'm trying to get to at least as as myself as a, as an artist, um, a writer will start and um, we will they will take a pen and will they, they will take a paper and they would write uh, I don't know serial killer in Seattle, simple as that. They will sit with this idea for six months, then it will go on to a script. Then after about three months, it goes to a director. The director will take it, take a look at it. They will sit with it, develop it for another three months, maybe. Uh, then a casting director comes, then actors come in and they take this and then they sit with it. The producers come in, they go into shoot for about 30 days, 40 days, 50 days, 60 days. Then they finish and then they come to you and then the picture is locked or it's not locked and then they call, hey, we need music. Okay. And you're like, cool, no problem. When do you need it? And they're like, tomorrow. So <laughs> what I what what is the difference? The difference is that this writer has spent three years of their life with this story, with this characters, with each one of these. He he knows, he, she knows, they know exactly what when this person picks their nose, when they eat their breakfast. They they know everything about it. When I am on a project, I try to do that in a much condensed time. I'm on this project. I want to know everything. I want to know everything about this person. I want to know where this person grew up all the way to where does, where is this ultimately going to end? Uh, when, when we go to black, what's going to happen three hours from now? You know, if I'm able to do that, if I'm able to kind of figure that out, whether it's me figuring out the region this person is from, me figuring out their story, me figuring out the background, whatever it is, that's all it is. You know, when Ludwig goes and figures, when Ludwig went and tried to record all of these things, when I go record bass clarinets and when I go study chance music or aleatoric music, I'm just trying to understand better. You know, uh, I'm trying to put my 10,000 hours in that project in order for me to be able to just go and play whatever on my fingers. You know, uh, composers are, uh, we are, we are, we're basically musicians that are always practicing and literally the first time you see you guys as audience see it that's our final concert that's been recorded 400 times the first time a director watches that's my first time being in concert in front of the musician in front of the director so as a musician as a guitar player how many times do you need to practice before you go in front of a concert it's that same exact thing you know, I'm trying to practice it under my fingers. I'm trying to practice it in my mind in order for all of this to kind of make sense before I give it to the director because they've spent three years on this thing. You know, same thing with me. So um, all of these creativities and all of these things is just I'm just trying to understand. Hans says it really, really well. He's like, it takes me a while for things to get under my fingers. And once it gets under my fingers, it's good to go. It's the same thing. That's why we write suites. That's why it t we write that 20 minutes of music. We're just exploring all of these things we're just grabbing onto things once we write that sweet that movie's right there you give me anything with those characters i'll write it you know um that's all the exploration i'm just practicing these are all kind of these things that i'm just practicing before i go in front of a concert so um you look at an athlete when you're about to go and 
in a marathon, how much practice they do. They go li weight lift, they go, uh, they have a nutritionist, they have all of these things. We have the same thing. We have orchestrators, we have copyists, we have nutritionists sometimes, we have stylists. All of those are just kind of back and forth. I'm going to go and understand how I'm going to weight lift by going and studying this region of music, or I'm going to go learn this new instrument, just like I'm going to learn how to tie my shoes again, you know? Do you ever, at first, I think that's like, that's such a good way to describe everything. <laughs> I mean, because it like suddenly it becomes universal for someone who doesn't even know film music exists, like they sure. can listen to that and go, oh shit, like it, it makes total sense. Sure. Sure. Um, but at least that, I try. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. But with that, and you know, understanding the the time constraint that you as the composer are under, compared to everybody, well, not I don't want to say everybody else, but like a lot of the other pieces in the process. Mm -hmm. Do you ever? I don't want to say. Do you ever feel cheated? But do you ever get to the end and then look back and be like, man, if I had. A couple more weeks, I'd have done this, or I'd done that, or I wish I could have done. First thought else. is best thought. First thought is best thought, always, always. Um, once I've learned that, that's the end of it. You know, first thought is best thought, and then if it doesn't happen, just keep going. Um, it has, um, you know, I. It's not a disadvantage when you're on the project. Um, it's a disadvantage when we're demoing. That's a big disadvantage for us. Um, you know, again, we are, us as composers, we're very competitive. We're a very competitive group of people, and that's lovely. I love that shit. Uh, but at the same time, we get a call after these three years that this director has spent, and they're like, hey, we're going to send you a scene tomorrow. We need this by end of the week. And you're like, cool, no problem. Um, what is this about? And... And they're like, well, okay, yeah, this is about this person, blah, 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 blah. All right, cool, no problem. How long have you been writing this? Can I at least sit and think about this? You know, that's the disadvantage. Again, that I come back to that whole thing of we're just very good improvisers. You know, we have we know how to put our hands down on something and be like, this is sad. And unfortunately, this is sad when I go like, when I put my fingers on a specific three notes, this is sad. It works, unfortunately. If it didn't work, we would have to create again. And right now, it's these three notes are sad, and let's reuse it and reuse it and reuse it because it's easy. We don't have the time in order for me to recreate what's sad. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and I guess it's part of that, too, in the demoing process where, I'll be honest, I have no idea how many composers a director or a studio might reach out it's to. It's crazy. To, <laughs> but, but look, you're saying, you know, it's these, these three notes, just pie, play, you know, a, a slow, somber piano. And like, it's, it's all like, that's functional. It works really well. Sure. It gets it across. But you know, when you've got a week, you know, how much um, can you do? But like, it's, it's also going to sure. be the first thought a lot of people have as well. A lot of other demos. So like, how do you, how do you draw that line of, of you know, doing something that works, but that's not super obvious. For sure. I mean, I've um, from a, a lot of people know me. I'm I'm one of the most honest people in the world, and I say it as exactly as it is. Um, on average, when you send a demo, you're dealing with like six other composers on average. So uh, it's not just about the demo. Uh, it's not about the music. It's about a lot of other things. And and and, and I, I I I teach that to my students. It's a lot of other things. However, coming back to the demo, it's this idea of like. The demo is the hardest thing you can do. Uh, whether you get the project or not, you're putting in so much and so little time, creativity, mentally, physically, um, emotionally. For a week, you're just trying to condense this three years, four years, whatever amount of time in this one, one minute of music to try to tell people, hey, I understand this character. I've... I have 20 years of experience understanding this culture, whatever. Um, I've done my studies of Western music, and I have this many credits in one minute. And, and then also, I have to tell you what the story of that character is in that one minute. That's what composers, that's, that's how, you know, if you're really good at doing a demo, you're going to get a lot of jobs. Um, but at the same time, we're just all very good at doing 
Um, so when it comes down to it, it's not about music anymore. It's it's about a lot of other things. But when you do it right and when you do get a good demo, uh, a lot of times it has happened to me that I write a piece of demo and that piece of music that I wrote for the demo will never make it anywhere because our direction has changed. I've actually got to talk to the director and the director's like, this is great, but this is not what I was intending. I only hired you because you it just sounded good or your package was better than everybody else. Uh, so, or you just, I don't know, uh, when I talked to you, you gave me a better sandwich after it. Literally, that's those are the things. Because, <laughs> um, listen, man, everybody, whoever is at least, at least if I say, when we are up for a project, everybody is pretty much in the same category of composers unless there is a wild card in there. So when we send out a demo, we have no idea what we're trying to do. Uh, it's all usually blind because we're not getting information too much about it. We are like, okay, so here we need music like this other composer and we're like cool no problem here's my take on that but at least allow me to talk to you in order for me to represent me to you whether that's me as Nima writing a thriller or whatever it is at least let me understand who it is uh, and it's just not not me I, I mean composers I, I wish this was a little bit more of a kind of a um collaborative effort at the beginning of the job you know i love when i get on a project and i'm on the project beginning during the script stages um i get to write music with the director without picture and it's like hey we're actually imagining what it's supposed to look like you know um there was a time when composers used i'm going on tang off a tangent sorry composers it. used to composers used to not be able to play anything for a director unless you were on the stage with the orchestra you know that the imagination is gone for a lot of filmmakers. Um, even for me personally, I don't know how to do that. I have no idea. I have to try it on a sequencer. I have to figure it out. I have to get my input unless it's like, hey, let's go and record nine clarinets. <laughs> you know, uh, that's that's the that's the thing. But um, I went off. But coming back to it, it's literally just um, the demo process is more of kind of this condensed boot camp of understanding the story and whether that piece of music that you write against picture is exactly right or not it's literally not it's it has to do with a lot of different things um and sometimes it just literally has to do how the filmmaker woke up that morning you know see that's that's so interesting and that's something that i think like literally anyone listening will be able to understand because look that's that's like the any job search process you know someone sure. looking at your resume like you know maybe they stubbed their toe 10 minutes before and they're in a bad sure. mood like they're gonna look at it and you know toss yours aside for sure you know um in a lot of artistic industries um we do not have a blind audition process where you are presented as just your art and you are literally this is it there is nothing behind it there's no roots under it there's no angels above it it's literally just an art kind of very similar to a painting when you look at a painting that's the finished product you know that's a poster obviously uh, but that poster when you're looking at it that's the finished product unless i go and search who this person is and what their story history is and what they've done I'm not going to know what this person did, you know? Same thing. If you look at a house, the architect is an architect. You have no idea who that person is. When they pitched for that job, I wish it was that. It was, hey, I'm just sending you a piece of music. You have no idea who I am. I'm just writing you against picture. So let's make it that, you know? Um, whether it's just the art speaking or not, I love that it's not just the art. There's a story behind every piece of art that's being made. But... When it comes down to it, to these kind of demo process to kind of come back to it, it's just really difficult because you might hit it off with that director and you might be getting drinks the next day, but that director might not be hiring you because they just have no idea what you are about, even though you're best friends tomorrow. And you're going to work on together on the next project, but on that project, you just have no idea what you've given them, you know? It's interesting you mentioned the, the idea of a blind auditioning process. Cause I know that's something that various orchestras have been trying out um, you know because there's such a disparity amongst sure. uh, their membership and is that is that something that you've ever encountered where it's just no. like 
just the demo? No. I would love that. And I'm trying to make something of a platform that is able to do that. Um, we have it a lot in other things. We have, um, you know, I've, I've been a victim as well as I've been a, a winner of that situation when I go up for a project and it's not just about the music. And, um, and if it was just about the music, we would not be trying to have advocacy for these things. You know, if it was just about the music, we would never be talking about, uh, talking about, hey, let's push this minority group and let's try to get them a little bit. Kind of, if it was just about that, if it was just about the art. Unfortunately, it's not just about the art anymore. Um, but I wish it was. Um, blind auditions, I think, would would level the playing field of the, of the idea of that it's just the art. Uh, but it would also kind of make it very much of a disadvantage for a lot of different people as well. Um, some people are just really good at sequencing, and mm -hmm. that's going to sound amazing. Um, and some people are just amazing um, orchestrators, so it's and, and they're just not good at sequencing, so that's going to sound different. But, um, I mean, blind art could work in a lot of different things, and it could not. But, I mean, digital art, um, people that do graphic design, you know, um, they're just kind of doing the same thing as, as we're doing. I, I like to compare us uh, musicians and composers. Um, we're a lot more of a fresh industry. You know, um, I, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you how long we've been kind of composing, forever, whatever, 300 years, 400 years, whatever. Um, against picture, it's been very, very fresh. So we don't have a lot of those things as like graphic artists that they've established with tons of people in it. You know, we have probably a thousand working composers you know and graphic artists or you go on starbucks there's three graphic artists sitting there with their ipads um so our industry is still very fresh in understanding all of these things um and i wish there was a little bit of a better understanding for people at least getting into the business you know um i still get students asking me hey how much am i supposed to charge for this i'm like <laughs> wow you should like you should know how much you're supposed to be making as a composer you know um just like just like hey i'm gonna go work for nike you know how much you're gonna make as a salary um and they've taught you that in school uh they've taught you all of that stuff you know that's i think that's a really interesting point it's something that i've thought about at least with the the form of film music because it's been around for you know a hundred hundred some odd years there you go and in like so much of it is still very much married to like the operatic Wagnerian uh, light sure. motif. It's like, like yeah, that works, but it's also like, I mean, film is a different medium than opera as well. Um, but it's especially with even past a hundred <laughs> years, it has become a different medium. Yeah, yeah, and, and and I find like that's what's interesting. You look at the last couple decades, especially how much growth and change there's been as far as the like literal music being played but i find it really interesting that even with a lot of music schools and universities having film music programs that a lot of other things seem to be lagging really far behind for sure um you know i was uh this is gonna sound like i'm shitting on ucla even though i'm not <laughs> um you know, I was I, I started teaching at UCLA, and one of the reasons I was teaching is I have I have a lot of interns. A lot of interns come through my uh, studio, so and me being an open book, they've been an open book to me, and they kind of tell me, talk to me about the system, the, the way that it is. Um, because this has been around for hundreds of years, and we are all been this kind of group of people that say, hey, learn the techniques before you break them. Unfortunately, there's no technique <laughs> in media composition. You know, it's there are techniques of you copying Beethoven and Bach and Jerry Goldsmith and Bernard Herrmann, but they were copying Jerry Gold. They were copying Beethoven. They were doing that. So our techniques are coming back to these Western cultures and Western music and Western, um, uh, as you said, it's Wagnerian kind of music. But we don't have a technique in media composition. I can't put it down on paper how you would score a love scene you know it's a, it's storytelling uh so why are we putting a hey you have to record an orchestra today you know um i i do it but then i bring it back into the computer and i fuck with it and i'm like okay this is this is it <laughs> this fits against picture you know um 
a, a very interesting example and I tell all my students to go watch is Justice League. Two different composers compose that movie and two different completely different movies are presented. It's a wonderful representation of what is possible against picture in a very big studio format and what two composers can do. We've seen it multiple times with composers that get fired and then they get refined their music, but it's such an awesome example of you seeing two different, completely two different filmmakers working on the same subject matter. Um, but again, I think, I think a true media composition is someone that looks at picture or whatever, looks at the media that they're working on and understands it the best way that they can and represents that. Whether it's a comedy, you as a composer, if you're trained enough, you better be able to write a comedy if that's what's being asked of you. Um, and that's, that's, a true, that's a true composer, you know? Um, I could close my eyes and I could write a uh, love scene for you. Um, and I hope that's what you're trying to do, you know? It comes back to that whole thing of like authenticity. Um, I'm trying to be authentic to that character, you know? So I'm gonna go understand you, whoever you are I'm talking to on the other side of Zoom. I'm gonna try to kind of give you exactly who I am because you deserve that. So um, same thing on picture, I'm not gonna half-ass myself uh, even though I'm getting paid half the money on the next job. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm still gonna give you my authentic self because I'm gonna give you everything. Uh, and I think that's what people should do in art in general. Um, understand it the best way possible and not break the rules, but still have your own self, you know? No, I mean, it, it makes sense. I think as a film composer, you're in a more difficult position than a lot sure. of other artists are because you're not you're not just painting a painting because like that's what you want to create. You're collaborating with other people and at the end of the day it's like it's a director's film and there are producers and studios sure. and all that. But Most yeah, of, yeah. I, I imagine finding the place where it's still authentically you amidst all of that is tough. You know, they they give us the canvas, they give us our their shades of gray and whites. We're the ones that's supposed to figure out the rest of the colors, you know? Uh, sometimes they sketch it out for you. Sometimes your outline is there. Sometimes you have the person outline that's like, here's your hand, here's where the house is gonna go. But even then, you could look at Picasso and he's done the same thing. There's a house, there's a little lake, there's a human. And then you look at Klimt and he's done completely the same thing. You, there's a human, there's a little thing and it still serves the same exact purpose. You know, I was watching this movie that, um, uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not gonna name names, but uh, but it was it was Philip Glass. It was Philip Glass, mm -hmm. not on a movie specific movie, and it was a very un Philip Glass movie. And I was I was watching it, and I was like, this is such an interesting way of scoring this movie, because I would have never expected it. You know, they went to Philip, and they were like, hey, dude, give us who you are in this genre, and. I'm assuming that's what he did. He was like, oh, I don't know how to do this. Let's figure <laughs> out how to do this. It's like that knock, knock, Philip Glass, knock, knock, Philip. You know what I mean? Uh, knock, knock, who's there? Knock, knock, Philip Glass, Philip Glass, knock, Philip Glass, Philip Glass. Uh, but what's, what's great about it is that, you know, I was like watching it. I'm like, whoa, I would have never expected that. Same thing. Like you watch Social Network. You're like, whoa, I never expected that. You watch Soul. Whoa, I never expected that. Ben Wallfish. Oh, I never expected that. Um, I would like to have more of those woes. I never expected that. And those are very, very far and few in between. Um, but again, if um, I think it all comes back to this understanding of um, film and understanding stories and understanding the craft itself. Um, I scored 30 short films when I was in school, you know, <laughs> because I just wanted to understand it. I wanted to understand filmmaking. Um, once you, uh, it's this is very simple. Once you get your ten thousand hours, it's a different life. It's a different life. Um, I see you have guitars behind you, uh, and you've kind of guitar cases. But I'm, I'm assuming you play guitar a lot. Uh, and there was a moment where you were like, "Whoa, this feels different. This feels more in tune with what I'm doing." And that's that's those getting close to that ten thousand hours. How long have you been playing guitar? Oh, uh, since I was 14 or 15, so So you have your 10,000 hours. So you have your 10,000 hours. 
So if I take that instrument away from you for 10 years and you get it back, you will probably play the same exact way. You know, it's, you you know, it's, it's funny you say that because that's basically what's happened. I haven't played in like five years and have just Very gotten much. all these back. It's, it's in your life. It's who you are. Um, just like if I, if, I, if I asked you, hey, what is the shape of an A minor chord? You know, if, you, if your mind is cold, you know exactly what that shape is. So same thing with me. I know what a love seat is. I could close, I could, I, that's, I practiced it enough that I could, uh, that I've mastered it. <laughs> yeah. It's like when you're practicing religion, then you become an atheist and you've mastered religion. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's that same kind of guy. Like, I'm, I'm good, man. I've, I've understood how to write a love scene. But now what I'm trying to do is how do I not write music for a love scene? And how do I bring that world back? Can I, can I put a hammer dulcimer in a love scene and I could still get the same emotions? You know, now it's about emotions for me. Now it's about the, there are multiple ways to skin a cat and it's the same exact thing. It's, there's multiple ways for me to tell you, hey, feel sad. Uh, I, I just have to figure out those frequencies. Uh, um, and that's about it. That's why, our comp that's why composers are always gonna exist even though those machine learning, amazing computers that are gonna write mm -hmm. music for us will, will be there. Um, and I would love, that's, it's gonna be amazing. Uh, and I'm excited for that. Uh, but at the same time, humans are going to be able to give the emotions unless we figure out something else. See, and, and this is going to take us on like such a brief tangent that I wasn't expecting. But I find <laughs> it really interesting that you're excited for the, the prospect of like AI writing music. Because I think Very a much. lot of people in music are the exact opposite. They're like, no, that's not real. Like, that's bullshit. People are writing music. Well, sure. We are writing music. But here's the thing, um, it's gonna make humans write better music. It's gonna make humans write a little bit more of interesting music. We're gonna try to be like, listen, I, I worked on Detroit Become Human and that was one of those things that I was like, I went off and I was like, all right, I'm gonna become as, become as authentic as possible. And what, I, what did I do? Well, I was like, all right, how does a robot make sounds? What, is the, what, are, what are these? theories what are the what can what can i do can an actual uh, robot cr create music um but at the at the at the end of the day um you know what's 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 really funny about it is that it's all about frequencies and emotions I, we were talking about that and if a robot is able to figure out these frequencies that go together and make that emotion true there still needs to be someone that's going to massage it into place but also what's going to be awesome is that a lot of the music that we are now getting that we're like, oh, well, we've heard this before. Oh, we've heard this before. Those we've heard this before, we don't have to write those anymore. You know, yeah. we're going to focus on the other things. But at the same time, what I'm really excited about technology is that, again, we are a hundred year, as you said, a hundred year industry that the only thing that technology wise we've kind of gotten into is MIDI. That's been the biggest thing that we've ever had and now VSTs and all that stuff. For us to imitate these thousands year old instruments that have always been created, now we can do it with a keyboard. We're able to do that. What's next? You know, what's next? Can, can, a, can a computer control your emotions? I would like to see that. I would like to see. I would like to see adaptive music going through films. I would like to see things that are just like a little bit more kind of personalized to people. You know, um, movie making. Um, when you make a movie, is more of a crowd entertainment. Um, especially nowadays, we are we're a lot more isolated. So, I think these isolated instances of entertainment can be a lot more personalized. And I think these personalized things has to be done with technology that we just have no control over. You know, um, there are chips that you could put inside your body now that control your vital signs. Uh, you know, I would be one of the first people that would get it because I would know exactly what I'm expecting. Same thing with music. You know, if I'm playing a video game, if I'm playing Call of Duty, and uh, it doesn't matter which one, whichever one, if I'm not, if if I haven't gotten my blood pressure high enough. We've lost the chance for the audience to get their pressure high enough in order for me to be able to tell my best story. 
So that's what I'm excited about. Um, technology is an amazing thing. We don't have that much in our music industry. We we have 4K, we have 6K, we have 8K, we have 12, whatever. All of these things. We have we have people talking about surround audio. These things, but music hasn't evolved. We're still recording a violin the same way that we've been recording a violin. Uh, we are still putting the same exact strings on a cello that we've been doing for this many years. You know. Um, People get pissed when I go and record uh, record cellos with with violin strings on it. But you know, again, it's this is a playground for me. I play music. I don't make music. You know. I love it. And and honestly, I I I wanted to get into a bunch of your films and specifics of cues and palettes and all that stuff. But like, been chatting for a while, and frankly, <laughs> this this was like such a good optimistic like excitement for the future moment to end on dude of course i mean again like uh if you if you look at the stuff that is happening now um there are some cool composers out there i'm excited to see the, when the right project comes for them what they can do with it um i'm excited for just people just running away from the traditions and um i'm also excited when traditions come back you know Film composing is a very much of a circle or thing that we start from, like, very classical. We have these trends. We come back mm -hmm. to them all the time. I've been around it many times. Uh, and it's fun. It's really fun because, like, I'm like, oh, we're coming back to this. Uh, but, <laughs> like, it's this trend of, like, going classical, modern, classical, modern. And it's, uh, it's we're in this cusp of, like, this change again. And then we're going to come back to it. It's going to be awesome. Uh, but it's, it's all, again, um, our industry is a very kind of, fresh industry but at the same time it's um we as younger generations are supposed to be the ones that are kind of make this last for us and are for our kids and for the little two-year-old that comes into the studio you know that's that's who i was i was a i was i was this 10 year old kid that used to play music i was this 20 year old kid running around studios you know that's who i was and that's i hope that's what we're going to try to kind of keep for the next generation with real composers and people that actually want to do this shit you know with real composers and with uh, some ai thrown in the mix as well oh love that man why not <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen i love it and like i'm so glad you're able to join me i had a great time talking and now i'm i'm in a i was already in a good mood i'm in a better mood <laughs> for the rest of the evening at least Anytime, man. I'm around. Anytime you want to chat, I'm, I'm around. We'd love to do this again anytime. Excellent. Well, uh, again, appreciate it. And I think it's only, what, 4 o'clock for you, so you still got the whole day ahead of you. I still have three more hours to write another few. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, ho I hope this was a good uh, chance to procrastinate a little bit. It was absolutely. It was. I'm going to go watch another movie now uh, before I write. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, man. I really appreciate it.